The Toyota Highlander was not in dire need of a refresh, but for 2023, it received one anyway. And the result is a stern message to its competitors. If you enjoy fun, detailed car content without fluff, consider subscribing and hitting the bell for notifications. The big news for 2023 comes under the hood. So the base 3.5 liter V6 has now been replaced with a 2.4 liter turbo four. We also see notable tweaks to tech and standard features. And to no one's surprise, this comes with a slight price increase. If you want a bare bones L or the cool band teacher XSE, which adds a sport tuned suspension, you will have to go turbo. If you want the bronze edition, you're getting a hybrid, something I will make a dedicated review on in the future. For 2023, Cypress Green joins the lineup and the base L trim now gets Toyota's smart proxy key, which comes with push button start. In terms of features, every single one is going to have LED headlights. If you step up to the platinum though, you get swiveling ones, along with a 360 view camera that's an option on the limited. And to help you through these murky times, so long as you get the LE, you will have LED fog lights. And to assist with your next car purchase, call Royal South Toyota in Bloomington, Indiana, the friendly dealership that has let me test drive a few Highlanders over the years. Royal South is heavily invested in the community with a diverse inventory. Check them out and tell them thanks for me. The new 2.4 liter twin scroll turbocharged inline four has been used in the Lexus NX since 2021. It's also going to be found in the new Toyota Crown. And here it makes a little bit less horsepower than both of those at 265, which is a decrease of 30 peak horsepower. That's the key word here because this makes 310 pound feet of torque. A big thing that was holding back the previous generation was you had it hooked up to a transmission tuned for gas mileage, which means you would have to firmly request acceleration to get into the V6's strong power band. Since torque and RPMs are the big factors of power, this new engine with about 50 more pound feet doesn't need to spin as fast to get the same work done. Here with the turbocharged model, I mean, honestly, it feels a lot more alive than the old V6, but there are some trade-offs. I mean, just half throttle here, scoots up to 60 miles per hour with no problem. And the eight-speed automatic is also smooth. And I think it's better outfitted to the turbocharged powertrain than the old V6. Now, the one thing I will note, I think the old engine had a more refined sound to it, whereas this is kind of raspy and does sound like a Camry four cylinder. I think Mazda's 2.5 turbo uh, seems like a more premium powertrain. And that CX-9 engine also has a little less turbo lag, though this still has great response for forced induction. In terms of gas mileage, the hybrid will make a fool of the turbo, but at least both are rated on regular fuel. Now, if you're thinking about gas mileage, yes, this is roughly the same as the previous car, which was still very good. Toyota says that they did this more so because of emissions, which it does perform much better in that regard. And I have no complaints when you also have a more usable power band. Really, uh, just step on it a little bit, and this is a lot more thrust. But let's see what the numbers say with a quick dash to 60. I got a zero to 60 time there of 7.4 seconds, a middle of the road figure for this kind of vehicle. But I think that when it comes to the actual usability, this is great, you know, it downshifts to where it needs to be. You know, that 2,500, 3,500 RPM seems to be its sweet spot. Uh, when it comes to road noise, that's kept down. I do notice some more wind noise when you bring it up to higher speed, but I'd still call this competitive for the class. Now, if you want better gas mileage with still respectable performance, you can get the 243 horsepower hybrid variant. That's going to pack a 2.5 liter naturally aspirated engine. It 
is paired up with Toyota's eCVT that was ultra smooth and provided respectable performance when I drove one a couple years ago. That powertrain uses a separate motor to continuously change the gear ratio and helps with regen. It doesn't feel natural as the revs pick up and drop at a moment's notice, but response is great as a result. The electrified variant will bow out to the turbo when it comes to towing capacity. One feature that I find elusive on a lot of car brands, including Toyota, is rain-sensing windshield wipers. You only get that if you go up to the platinum trim. While taking this thing off-road may be a worse idea than the car bra, this does have eight inches of ground clearance if you must. When it comes to making a good use of its off-road angles, the Highlander will come standard with front-wheel drive, but you can opt for all-wheel drive. It's around $2,000 extra. It's primarily front wheel drive, but it is constantly monitoring to send power to the rear, of which it can send up to 50%. And then for the XSE Limited and Platinum, you will have their dynamic torque vectoring all wheel drive, which hasn't really proven itself to be super capable off-road, but it seems like something that would help for icy snowy roads, which is a much more realistic usage. And that actually, through the differential, sends more power to either side. Uh, that's only at the rear differential. You will have brake vectoring to help shift power side to side at the front and at the rear. The standard all-wheel drive setup purely relies on this brake vectoring in tricky scenarios, as does the hybrid model. That also comes with front-wheel drive as standard and offers a 4x4 variant, but with that setup, it actually adds a separate motor to get the thing off the line and assist with traction. That too is not geared well for off-road. The lower half of trim will get 18 inch wheels like what I have here, whereas the upper half of trims will have 20s. If you want to take the L on your Highlander, then you will not have a power rear gate, but that comes standard on every other trim. I go all the way up to the Limited and you'll actually get a hands-free version, but at the very least every Highlander will have LED tail lights and a spoiler. Now one thing I do think is interesting, this has a manual mode and not the sequential mode that Toyota has been using for a while. This actually will shift when you tell it to shift, whereas the sequential mode, you set the highest gear that the vehicle will be willing to go into. Here at 60 miles per hour, we're looking at about 1500 RPMs a hair over, so the engine doesn't have an issue droning at highway speeds, though it does make its four cylinder self known uh, when you try to accelerate. When it comes to road noise, that's kept down. I do notice some more wind noise when you bring it up to higher speed, but I definitely label this as competitive for the class. And if you want to isolate yourself even further, you can get acoustic front glass on the Platinum and Limited. The cabin space won't match the outright girth of a lot of the three row crossovers available right now, but as a result, I think the Highlander's interior is a more inviting place to be. First, let's talk materials. So you're gonna have a decent amount of soft touch materials on my outboard knee here, a little bit on the mid dash plush elbow rests. And while I would like to see a little bit less hard touch plastic in here, I'm happy that they used more matte finishes over all of the controls. That way they age a little bit better and don't get dirty as quick. However, if you want the most opulent Highlander, shoot for a Platinum or Limited that comes with softer materials, more padding, and wonderful glossy plastic. And while aesthetics are all subjective, I think that the dashboard layout here feels fresh. Maybe not as eye-catching as some competitors, but at the very least classy. And when it comes to the tech, it's also improved for 23. You have Toyota's new multimedia interface, and it is leagues better than it was in the past. We have a quicker response time, better resolution, and just a more modern look. Although the omission of a home page might need to grow on me a little bit more. However, if you don't like the UI, you can just use Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which are standard and they're wireless. You also will have an eight inch unit as standard but you get this extravagant 12.3 inch screen on the bronze edition limited and platinum and you can opt for it on the xle and xse you don't gain any perceivable speed or pixel density with the bigger setup but i do prefer this widescreen to the gargantuan 14 inch unit on the sequoia which has icon sizes fit for your great grandma's home screen the stock six speaker sound system is decent but also winded by the cabin size an 11 speaker jbl set up should provide more punch and crispiness. 
It's available on the XSE, Standard on Limited, and Platinum. All of those trims also gain ambient lighting to enhance the mood. You're also going to find a 12.3 inch screen in the gauge cluster if you go with the Limited or Platinum. And I've found those to have a high resolution and I've seen that to be intuitive in other implementations. However, today I have the seven inch driver display. That's now the new standard screen. When it comes to comfort, I am six foot three and it's fairly easy for me to find a comfortable position here with standard lumbar control. You're also going to have cloth seats on the L and LE, but the XLE and XSE get my preferred seat, which is soft tax. It's a plush yet durable leather alternative. Of course, you can get the real thing if you step up further. Though, you just need the XLE if you want heated seats. The Limited and Platinum will get you ventilation. Those trims also get a heated steering wheel. If you just want a leather-wrapped one, avoid the otherwise generously equipped L trim, which also packs tri-zone automatic climate control. XLE buyers get a standard sunroof, and the Platinum adds a heads-up display. If I were to nitpick, I could say that these seats maybe need a slightly longer seat box. Bottom. They do offer good support and have a mild contour to them, so I don't see too many people complaining about these. Although I do want to voice my concern in one other area. I think this center tunnel here is just a little bit too wide. The door panel also protrudes out. That has soft touch and that's fine, but I do think that this may not work super well if you have super thick legs. Other tech stuff standard includes five USB ports, four of which are USB-C, and then they moved the wireless charging pad from the center console to a much more useful area right here below the HVAC. And while in the conversation here of storage, no cup holder will fit a 40 ounce hydro flask, but there are a fair amount of cubbies. And of course we have a sunglasses pocket slash dad mirror. The interior likely won't woo wealthy in-laws, but the sturdy construction helps justify the only adequate materials for a $46,000 SUV. Behind myself in the second row of the Highlander, I have plenty of space, partially due to me screwing over the person in the third row with the uh, sliding rear seat here. The interesting part is that the control on the side of the seat, which is actually a nice touch as that should make adjusting the seat for a child less cumbersome. Another good thought is the wall socket port you get in the back of the Limited and Platinum. But the absurd thing is that it jumps from 100 watt to 1500 with the hybrid, which adds another port in the back, a capacity almost four times that of the new hybrid Sequoia and Tundra. I am met with soft touch elbow rest here with the captain chair setup. You can get a bench seat as well. If you step up to the Platinum, you're gonna have heated rear seats. And while you technically do have four cup holders back here, two of them are set right here in the console in between the middle seats. I wish you could take it out like you could in some previous generation Highlanders, but uh, it's pretty adamant on staying in place. The XLE buyers will also get rear sunshades. All of them will have vents at the, both the feet and up here next to your face. Recline these soft and supportive seats for a truly pleasant road trip position, assuming the people you just crunched in the third row don't test your mortality. Hopping into the third row is a somewhat easy process. This isn't where I would advise spending a great deal of time if you're an adult. My size 13 shoes do fit underneath the seat. Oh my god. Now, see, you're probably not going to want to sit like, like this <laughs> if you're uh, going anywhere, but if you can compromise, this is much more livable. And you still have the soft tech seats. Yes, there's no soft touch material where your elbows rest. And this window, while present, not entirely big, allows for a passable third row experience. This is technically a three wide third row. So if you have children with friends, this should do the job just fine. Just make sure nobody in the second row gets too greedy. Now, if you thought the third row of the Highlander didn't offer too much dignity, you didn't try sitting in the cargo area. But to be honest, for this wheelbase in length, this is a respectable amount of space. You have a cargo area that's very usable, but definitely shy of what some other competitors offer. And this trend continues with all of the seats folded. Really, if you want the most spacious three row SUV from Toyota, technically that's not even the Sequoia, it's the Forerunner.
by a slim margin with all the seats folded. If you need a three row crossover and cargo capability is among the top priorities for you, there are better options than the Highlander. Over harsh roads, the Toyota Highlander is among the most comfortable in the class for a variety of reasons. One, insulation. It's a pretty quiet car over imperfect surfaces, but it's also control. Going over here where it's very uneven, each side of the vehicle is doing completely different things, the car feels stable and there's no shuddering throughout the chassis like you get a ton of with the new Toyota Sequoia. It's just a very forgiving ride. Some of that may come down to the extra sidewall here with the XLE. And again, it's still controlled. There's not really, you know, a ton of body roll or anything. I think that Toyota nailed the ride quality of the Highlander. But you can also get a sport suspension if you go with the XSE. I haven't driven that one yet, but if you guys want to see that, I'll try to get a hold of one. Now when it comes to handling here in our XLE, you're going to have nicely weighted steering that is numb. And it's a little bit more vague on center especially than in what I would like. So there's more natural predictable steering in the class. Really if you care about handling and you want a you know $40,000-ish three-row SUV, get a Mazda CX-9 that's gonna be a little bit tighter than this, but a much more engaging experience for sure. However, most people aren't buying these for that. They would prioritize confident handling more than anything else, and this provides oodles of that. Uh, chucking it on, you know, not a great road. You can tell that the platform that underpins this also underpins even vehicles from Lexus. Its chassis feels rigid, though don't expect luxury SUV dampening and poise. This really reminds me of driving a more beefy Camry with extra body roll. With the Highlander, I think visibility is one of the pros here. Yeah, out the side here, the belt line is probably in an average place, but I do like how the windshield feels kind of close to me and it's larger, I can still get a glimpse of the hood. And as I was talking about with the interior, this feels smaller than a lot of the other three row crossovers out there, despite having space more than healthy for a family. And the result on the road is a vehicle that I think is more approachable. Meaning if you are coming from a small car, the Highlander is a three row SUV that won't make you feel like you need a CDL and a beard to maneuver with conviction. While the size isn't scary, to some a turbocharged engine is is daunting due to added complexity and stress. But I'd like to remind you, not all turbo engines are made the same. This is the T24A FTS. Much of it derives from the venerable A25A four-cylinder found in many Toyotas from the last six years. The NX received this engine for the 2022 model year and it has not been the cause for a recall so far. It also does not use an electronic wastegate actuator like the one that initially caused issues with the Tundra. Just like nearly all Toyotas now, it has both port and direct injection to help keep the intake valves clean. This generation of Highlander, which has been out since 2020, has been largely reliable with no consistent powertrain issues. However, it has had some notable recalls related to the fuel pump and brakes. Some people have noticed inaccurate fuel gauges like what I've also heard from RAV4 hybrid owners. I want to recommend the Highlander to people who highly prioritize reliability, but time is going to have to tell all with the new engine. I am feeling optimistic though on this one. As is the case with basically every mainstream three row crossover, you will have adaptive cruise standard, autonomous braking standard, lane centering standard. This is Toyota Safety Sense 2.5, one of the latest systems. It works very well. I definitely hear less complaints with this than I do some other brands in terms of finicky braking. And blind spot monitoring is standard on everything except for the base L trim. Overall, the 2023 Highlander addresses some of the shortcomings of last year's model with a better power band and a fresh infotainment system. Those things combined with a comfortable, well-built, reasonably sized cabin, forgiving yet sure-footed ride, and Toyota's dependable reputation make it my personal recommendation if a Mazda CX-9 is simply too small. However, the competition is getting tougher as we speak. The competent Subaru Ascent just got a refresh, and though nobody has driven it yet, the new Honda Pilot looks like the foe to beat. Not to mention the vastly improved Nissan Pathfinder and the practical, luxurious Palisade and Telluride. There's so many great three-row family movers to consider right now, but if you place a high value on longevity and quality, the Toyota Highlander is my go-to for the moment. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then leave a like to help me conquer the YouTube algorithm.
If you'd like to see more, subscribe and hit the bell. And thank you to my loyal patrons. I'll catch you in the next one. Please don't squish me.